it will give it will give uh, opioids yes there are with regard to gut surgery there the uh, bowel stasis right but still if it is a severe uh, painful situation you can give right subcut morphine right that is the whole idea right that is the those are basic concepts treatment is step 1 step 2 step 3 these are not applicable when it comes to this question right this is major surgery patient with severe pain so you you can say preemptive and intraoperative analgesia post operative boluses through epidural and continuous infusions and uh, give we can start oral analgesics to address the basal level pain not basal pain level right and uh, uh, these are the concepts right what is this if you give strong opioids yes, there is chance for respiratory compromisation better monitor right and other thing what what, what is other, other component chronic pain post operative is a uh, you give, manage acute pain then address the chronic pain some people develop chronic pain due to uh, the surgery what is the best method of preventing chronic pain chronic pain means patient is having pain lasting more than 3 months right do you have to explain pain ladder in this question it's not not really you know you should i have mentioned everything but when you answer the question uh, answer related to this patient is it is it a post op is it then you can't just try the only this uh, oral analysis then wait then start next level you can't do like that you start with a pre op uh, intraoperative epidural and give top ups give boluses and maintain infusion at the same time you give oral analysis right that's how we do and uh, just mention about little mention little bit about uh, chronic pain best method to avoid chronic pain is uh, aggressive management of uh, post op pain then if you have encounter this chronic pain in this patient refer to uh, pain clinic and start second life that's that is the idea right okay we have done the first question any anything to clarify shall we move on to next question we can't wait no time is the limiting factor hypercalcemia following thyroidectomy anyone to answer give a shot give a give a try a nothing to lose right everyone is turning here didn't hear chronic pain management yes chronic pain management is mainly it you can prevent uh, prevent develop, prevent this chronic, chronic developing chronic pain by managing uh, post op pain uh optimal aggressive right if you develop chronic pain then you have to manage that uh, pain clinic with the, this uh, second line drugs like gabapentin right there are uh, different drugs no anti epileptic you can they try the isipam no strong second line analgesics right and little bit of this uh, uh, pain modification therapies right right hypercalcemia for thyroid anyone to answer what is the hello hello skip over there are there remover there are there remover he has mentioned uh okay so para the hormone less calcium absorbed from gut and less resorption from bone right he has mentioned that 
can't hold uh, this comment of uh, so let, let's move hypercalciferin thyroidectomy yes there are two reasons right i won't uh, pop in to chat uh, because we are running out of time once i uh, finish the uh, second question i'll answer right you can drop a text there right yes schema and aberrant remove yes that's right oh. let's see, let's see. Uh, hypercalcia one thing is ischemia why they why these parathyroid glands develop uh, ischemia reason is if you ligate uh, inferior thyroid artery if supply to parathyroid both parathyroid glands you ligate more uh, dist that means uh, away from the gland that will lead to ischemia right so patient will develop transient hypercalcia correct current technique is to ligate branches of the inferior thyroid artery on the uh, within uh, uh, within the gland on the gland after it uh, pierces the capsule right then other thing is accidental re removal right uh, that is two reasons then parathyroid gland is the endocrine gland produce parathyroid hormone parathyroid hormone what is the function of parathyroid hormone yes it increases osteoclastic activity mobilizes the calcium from bone bone absorption then uh, it uh, 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 stimulate this vitamin d tra transformation 121 hydroxy polycalciferol will be uh, 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 this uh, 25 hydroxy polycalciferol will be uh, uh, trans uh, this One alpha hydroxy hydroxylase enzyme will convert 25 hydroxy polycalciferol into 125 dihydroxy polycalciferol. Right. So uh, this 125 dihydroxy polycalciferol is the one which increases the intestinal, uh, which increases intestinal absorption of calcium. Right. Not the parathyroid hormone. So uh, this uh, parathyroid hormone stimulates the one alpha hydroxylase enzyme function. Right. Uh, other thing is uh, uh, parathyroid hormone increases the renal tubule absorption of calcium and increases the excretion of phosphate. Right? Those are the three actions which I mentioned. Then, due to uh, whether it is a reduction due to ischemia or whether uh, due to abscess removal, this will completely diminish. So those actions will. ियामिया Anjali Mendis, yes, she's, she's answering. Choice text. What is choice text sign? Choices, yes. Those are signs. Perioral numbness, yes. You are answering. Uh, what happens with the hypercalcemia? Huh? What is the reason for this perioral numbness and this tetany? What is the classic triad of hypercalcemia? Because because this hypercalcemic state will lead to uh, hyper excitable. Uh, will it will bring nerves into hyper excitable state? It will reduce the uh, threshold uh, of the desire threshold, which need to be, needed to be activated. The shoulder will be reduced due to hypercalcemic state. So easily, these nerves will be stimulated. It will be stimulated, right? When you uh, tap on the facial nerve, facial muscles will be contracted, right? Right? And uh, they will develop these carpopedal spasms. Your small muscles of the hand and the wrist uh, muscles, which actually wrist, will be contracted, right? 
then uh, due to this laryngeal muscle contraction, they will develop upper air obstruction and they will develop this uh, even they can develop seizures and cardiac arrhythmias, right? Cardiac arrhythmias due to hypocalcemia, right? Uh, due to uh, this parathyroid uh, deficiency, patient is patient due to hypercalcemia, uh, hyperphosphatemia, and metabolic alkalosis. Those are the physiological developments, right? The, as you all mentioned, some, some of you mentioned this first stage sign is the increased irritability of facial nerve, which is a contraction of muscle, which is supplied by facial nerve. Process means involved contractions of, contraction of muscles of the hand and wrist, right? So, how do you treat this condition? Those are the manifestations. We usually start manifesting after uh, first uh, 24 hours post operative, right? And if it is a ischemia, if it is due to ischemia, it will persist for six months at least. It is a uh, removal of the uh, uh, parathyroid gland. You have to replace the calcium throughout the life, right? And uh, if, if it's an emergency situation, hypercalcemic, if you encounter hypercalcemic tetany, uh, upper air obstruction, seizures, cardiac arrhythmias, you have to give IV calcium gluconate, right? 10% calcium gluconate, 10 ml or 10 minutes, right? And uh, yes, to maintain, you give oral drugs. Calcium carbonate is one half of what is zero. Uh, yes, that is very active. You know, everyone is on. That's good. Right? Uh, that's it. Uh, that's how you mentioned 34. This carries 35 marks. No? Two reasons. What is the action of parathyroid hormone? With the absence, what happens? What are the physiological derangement? Right? Hyperphosphatemia, hypercalcemia, and metabolic alkalosis. And what are the consequences? How do you manage acute condition? How do you manage uh, long-term problem? And what happens during uh, in ischemia? What happens in, uh, what is the long-term uh, disability due to accidental removal, right? And what is the color of this parathyroid gland? Do you want to answer? Color of the parathyroid gland. What do you do if you accidentally remove? Salmon, no, or rain. What is the color? Brownish, no? Yes. Golden yellow, that is the color. Yeah. Golden yellow is the correct color. Golden yellow, brownish, that's what we see. If you take it, uh, if you accidentally remove, you can. Embedded in external cardiac uh, yeah, you can embed it, slice, soap, just crush it and inject in the external cardiac right? Uh, right, that's it. Then, what is varicocele? Anyone to answer? Varicocele, you, you may have seen. Different different terms. Varicose veins in the lower limb, superficial varicose veins, esophageal varices, patient for hypertension, hemorrhoids, this photosystemic anastomosis, region of photosystemic anastomosis. Oh, this initial description is that. Yes. Some sort of venous engorgement there in the body situation. And now they say it's in the cushions, right? Forget hemorrhage, you see the varices, then varicose veins. Here, varicose veins is again venous engorgement in scrotum. What are the veins which get engorged here? Dilated, elongated, pampiniform plexus. Yes, dilated, you will, same description, right? You get, say in the lower limb, dilated, tortuous, abnormal veins. Those are varicose veins. Here, dilated, elongated, yes, pamphlexes and spermatic vein, right? Right? That is the definition. That is the varicose 
Why it happens? Why do they develop varicose? That is the other problem. And what is the clinical significance? How they present? What are the examination findings? What, what we will do? If you answer those questions, you are done. Right? What, which side is the proponents? How do they present? We will start from history. How do they present? Huh? Sometimes they come with subquartery, right? In the examination, sub screening, they will detect, right? In the clinical examination or in the ultrasound. Asymptomatic patient, even it can be asymptomatic, subquartery, then very non specific pain, right? Yeah, okay. people are answering, that's good, but I can't. Uh, yes, good, good. Keep on, keep on going. Right, that's good. Uh, okay, let's minimize this. Yeah, uh, yes, yes, that's right. Okay, I can see now. Lump in scrotum like a bag of bombs. Many left side. Why, why many left side? Uh, why? <laughs> we don't have much time to discuss. One by one, we'll uh, go with this, right? Uh, it's dilatation of amplitude venous plexus and interventional vein. That is the definition, right? Classification could be primary or secondary due to another reason, right? That is what I asked. Uh, then presentation. Could be asymptomatic, heaviness and pain, right? Examination, you will feel like a bag of bombs. You know, these dilated veins, you will feel like a bag of bombs, right? Uh, as it continues in the spermatic cord, you cannot get above. It will continue in the spermatic cord, right? Uh, sometimes it, it can be unilateral, sometimes it can be bilateral. But if it is not producible, then you have to think about secondary causes, right? Always compare with other side. Breast, hand, whatever thing you examine, always compare with other side. Right? And look for secondary effects due to this varicose. They will develop uh, this testicular atrophy due to this compression. Right? And look for other pathologies as well. And it's, it's, uh, abdominal examination is important if you uh, found a renal, uh, varicose because due to renal masses, they will get a varicose. This can be a presentation of renal mass. So abdominal always, if you examine, think about abdominal pathology, always examine scrotum. If you examine scrotum, don't forget to examine abdomen as well, right? And always compare both sides. Okay. And uh, you can do a venous duke plan, confirm your diagnosis, right? And the uh, other thing is, why do they get uh, varicose in the left side? That is due to yes. in the left uh, left uh, gonadal vein drains to left renal vein with an acute angle, right? And that is one thing. And it uh, it, it uh, this where it drains this phatic vein, gonadal vein drains in, in uh, re left renal vein, and in, in the junction they don't have these valves, right? They don't have valves. To prevent regurgitation and other thing is crack uh, this uh, crack knuckle this, uh, this uh, superior this uh, what is this superior mesenteric artery and aorta aorta this renal vein compresses right not cracker Phenomena. What is there? Is there? Ah, yes, of course. Yes, this. Mm. Presentation. Ah, yes. Angle is more common in the left side. You do. Angle at which the left testicular vein enters the left renal vein. Lack of effect and reflux valves. As, and increased renal vein pressure due to compression by supermissive guardian and order. Not track effect. Those are three reasons. That is why left is. Otherwise, left is longer, yeah. So, more vulnerable compression and pathology. Right. Then, if the patient is symptomatic, and if you are going to intervene, 
yes you should do a semen fluid analysis right one thing if the patient is suffer yes you should do other things medically uh, once you done the, done you done with surgery they will complain and uh, if you have done the sfa uh, you can refer the patient otherwise if you detect abnormal semen fluid and as after surgery if a pay, on a patient who have screened for that earlier that will be a problem right and uh, it's clinical diagnosis just supportive uh, investigation is there is venous duplex and uh, options for management uh, if it is asymptomatic you can leave it right if the patient is asymptomatic otherwise surgery ligation of the Varicoses is intrasynovic vein uh, via open surgery or laparoscopy, right? So those are the interventions, right? And there are the, always there are these new techniques, uh, embolization and everything, right? You won't, you don't have to mention all this. Just uh, give a brief history, a brief definition. Then, how do they present? Uh, it's only findings. Then the etiology. How do you manage this patient? Any diagnosis? There are five components, right? Any problem, any disease. There, there is an anatomical diagnosis. That is, in varicose is uh, uh, dilated uh, stamping of plexus. That is anatomical. And pathology, as we mentioned, uh, could be a renal cell tumor or not Kragel syndrome a phenomena, or it can be. Uh, idiopathic, so you have to uh, find the path pathology and etiology, right? Then the chronic, acute or chronic, then the complications. In, in this, uh, if it is a uh, acute condition, a previously examined patient will develop a new onset varicose that is more sinister, right? Uh, acute or chronic, then complications. Whether this patient is, has patient has developed complications due to this problem. Those are the five components in any diagnosis, any pathology. You have to address those five components, then you are done. Right? That is the thing in medical field. You all know this. This topic, no? We move on to other, uh, other one. Right? Mm, acute testicular torsion. Yes. Again, thirty-five marks. What is testicular torsion? What time? Is it surgical emergency? We are you. You get a ischemic. What are the five things we have to address? Yeah. Not address, but I said there are five components in diagnosis. Right? Anatomical, pathological, etiological diagnosis, then acute or chronic, and when the patient has developed complications. Even you when you when you make a diagnosis, those five components will be addressed by your history examination investigation, right? The same thing will be addressed here in a CQC asset. That's what I told. Right? Then testicular torsion, right? It's a it's a surgical emergency. Uh, uh, you get this uh, rotated vascular pedicle and uh, your testis will be ischemic at initial stage, and patient will develop intractable pain. Patient comes in intractable, sudden onset, acute uh, sort of pain. There may be a radiation to upwards, right? Going to radiation as well. There will be referred pain sometimes. That will be slid sometimes for urinary colic. And on examination, what are the signs and symptoms? Uh, signs. Is very tender, uh, tender, very tender, and there will be high riding testes with bell type of phenomenon, transverse like. And uh, if it is a uh, neglected case, that means patient is uh, presented uh, after reasonable time, after six, seven hours, once the uh, testes is made cross, there will be this bluish discoloration and everything due to venous condition, right? If this testicular torsion initially venous uh, veins will be obstructed, there will be venous in, uh, uh, obstruction and it will progress into artery occlusion as well. 
right? That is the uh, presentation, right? There are two four types, intravaginal, extravaginal. Some, some patients presenting perinatal, very early stages of their life, and some patients, most commonly present during puberty. But any age, it, can, it is possible, all right? But most common age period is uh, puberty and teenagers, right? Young patient. Etiology is unknown. Diagnosis is clinical. It's a clinical diagnosis. Acute scrotum in a pre-productive state, stage of male is unless proven otherwise testicular torsion. With the least suspicion, we should explore, right? That is the concern. You don't wait. Uh, even if you explore and you haven't find anything, that's all right. We can just close. If you don't intervene, patient will lose the testes and there will be a blood brain barrier disruption and this, uh, all the sperms will be distributed into blood circulation. They will develop antibodies against sperms and patient will be uh, infertile. They will become subfertile as well. So it's a serious issue. If you intervene early, it's a clinical diagnosis. If you have really doubt, just place ultrasound scan. But it's always a clinical diagnosis. Least, least suspicion, it's time for your uh, ultrasound scan. Go for exploration. That is the idea, right? Acute onset, you need ultrasound pain, severe in nature. Tender test is erythema erith and swelling is possible with this venous congestion and acute inflammation will be there. But its inflammatory features are very much less when it compared to epidermogramis, right? Acute epidermogramis. Highlighting, highlighting testes and transverse light is a uh, very uh, useful clinical sign. And other thing is cremastric reflex will be absent. This makes this fitness. As I remember, this is the only pathology of acute scrotal condition where you get a Absent cremastic reflex. I will say that it's difficult to elicit cremastic reflex in teenagers and male patients with puberty. It's almost diminished. Yes, in a child, yes, you can elicit, right? And see, but it's very difficult in real cell. Then, then what is the surgical intervention? You explore. If you found a uh, discolored, congested cyanostasis, you retest, well, you correct the testing and cover with warm saline towel and let it like that for 10 minutes and re-inspect. Uh, Most of the time, if the patient's presentation is less than six hours, this all discoloration and everything will go off as blood supply is reestablished, you untwist the vascular pedicle, then you can fix the testes into the uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, tunic albuginia and uh, coverings, three point fixation. Uh, the the outer muscle, everything, there's a covering of the scrotum, you can anchor it in three, three points, three point fixation. And you can come out, right? If it is necro, if, we, if it is gangrenous, yes, you have to do the orchidectomy. And important thing is, you have to fix the other side. Even if it's gangrenous or necros, even you end up orchidectomy, you should fix the other side. If you, it's a, even if it's salvageable, you have to fix the other side as well, right? That is a current practice, right? All right, that's it. Anything you have missed? Oh, no. That is the surgical favor of that question. You can mention all these, right? It's your duty to mention all these factors within this time period. Okay. Uh, 35 marks now. You can, you should include uh, etiology, then history examination. How do you manage, right? And complications. Yes, if it is more than six hours, the risk of patient, we can, patient can get uh, infertile.
you know, resorption of this uh, blood test is very and production of antibodies against sperms, right? Okay. We are moving to third question of one and a half hour. One and a half hours. Go on. So go quickly. This is this thing we have done right previously. Very easy question. Anyone to answer? We have discussed this topic. 42 year old premenopausal woman presents with lump in her left breast for two months, giving reasons outlined in this thing you perform to arrive at diagnosis. Anyone to answer? Come on. Anyone? Unmute and answer. Oh, this answer the chat at least. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, am I talking myself? All right. Okay. At least I can hear. You can hear me, no? If you can't hear me, just uh, let me know, right? Otherwise, I'll keep on talking. All right. Uh, right. Give the reason outline the investigation perform. In giving the reasons outline the investigations, right? Here they have omitted. Uh, they have omitted the history. Information they have given to some degree investigation in the sense in the triple assessment, clinical examination. They have omitted, they, they don't have to mention, right? As they have this imaging, uh, 48, two year old bilateral. Mammogram and uh, ultrasound scan with viral axilla as well. Both the message you can mention, right? Mammogram is the message twice, and we do the ultrasound too, as well as the axilla. At the same time, we can do the breast as well, right? We do both the investigation and the usual practice. We say mammogram is the uh, uh, given the age, and you can you should do the uh, ultrasound scan to assess the axilla with lymph node status, right? And you can just mention the features, mammography features, uh, all these uh, features when it comes to breast lesion and lymph nodes, right? Then, uh, then it's cytology and histology. Now, it's a current practice is performing a COBABS instead of FNS, right? To get the tissue diagnosis, if it is malignancy, you can do the immunohistochemistry and get the receptor status by the same sample. That is the advantage, right? You can get a, uh, in the cytology. You assess only the cells. You can get. You can't get an idea about this local invasion, right? And the receptor status. But here you, you assess the tissue. You can uh, get the tissue diagnosis and whether it's local invaded. Neural or vascular, and then that is the most striking thing. Well, someone has asked about this imaging last time, so I have kept a slide. Uh, what is this? We all want to discuss about this imaging. We'll discuss it later, right? Uh, just uh, someone asked about this obliterated fatty hilum, yes, and uh, my microcalcifications, irregular margins, this speculated margins, right? We, there are different different mammogram features, and also uh, in the ultrasound we look for cogenicity again, surface margins, right? We just describe all those things. Uh, uh, then, what else? Uh, next, those are the things you should mention. We will, I'll rush through this question as we have discussed up to some degree last time. This triple is one, you have to discuss the imaging and the, uh, uh, this triple assessment, and you will perform to arrive at a diagnosis, right? And at the same time, if it is a malignancy, you should stage the disease, right? Depending on the presentation, you should 
do the CCD chest abdomen uh, it is a brain mates right but here they have given the clinical picture so I think this will be enough right but if there are features of mets in a local regional disease you have to get the history with related to local regional disease and examine with related to local regional disease. I always think about mets right in investigation again you have to think about local regional involvement and mets right any for any malignancy, that's the that's the principle. Fnnc mammogram, mammogram to, uh, there's no place for fnnc. Now, right? Oh, what is the current trend? Uh, investigations establish a diagnosis of invasive duct carcinoma of breast. Her breast. Discuss the surgical options for managing. With regards to breast and axilla, again, 20 marks for it, we discuss, right? Depending on the stage, uh, early breast CA, uh, we can go for this uh, breast conservative surgery, right? If it is uh, uh, advanced local regional involvement, we give new adjuvant, and you can go for a mastectomy or uh, if it is downstage now there's a place for breast conservation after new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy as well that right but at your level you can say there are two options breast conservation surgery that's wide local excision of the local lesion or mastectomy right or less if patient is willing and this patient suitable as the early breast CA, doing a breast cancer surgery is beneficial as in, in with regard to cosmetic cancer and less tissue trauma. All these response, physical body response to the surgic, surgical trauma, as we mentioned earlier. So, as much as possible, do the less invasive surgery without compromising the outcome. According to current uh, evidences, breast cancer surgery doesn't carry any higher mortality. Mobility, right? So, possible breast cancer surgery is not mastectomy, right? Complete removal of the breast. If you do the mastectomy, there's a place for reconstruction with oncoplastic involvement, right? Uh, that's it, right? Then with regard to axilla, if it is a, if there's an nodal involvement, right, you would, uh, establish the nodal involvement again with same as breast lesion, imaging and cytology and surgery. There's a place of hobabsy as well, but we do in the current trend we do FNAC and confirm meds and do the level two axilla clearance. Uh, if it is not involved, if the axilla is not involved, if you extrude it clinically and through imaging, do the sentinel biopsy. You extrude by histology as well. If the sentinel node biopsy positive, again you do the level two axial clearance, right? That is the answer. Uh, why, why you uh, uh, why you don't do axial clearance uh, without uh, thinking much? Because axial clearance again carries a morbidity. Lymphedema, right? Pleroma formation. Everything complicates your postoperative period and, and, and removing breast in a young patient is also very psychological burden. So, world is moving to, towards conservative. Conservative means not the conservation. Not the, it's not the fact that we don't do surgery. We do remove the uh, pathology and address it targeted therapy. We will explain TNM staging in detail or not necessary, not necessary, right? Here they haven't uh, given the enough details. No? They just oh, you all know, they just want you all to describe the options, right? So explain in detail is about sentinel node biopsy and uh, how do you confirm the axial disease with imaging and FNAC and how do you do level two axial clearance rationale. Then if it is negative, how do you exclude further by sentinel biopsy? What you do 
but you do if center node becomes positive. That is with regard to axilla and breast. Regarding this TNM stage, again, your tumor size and favor, of, uh, as you mentioned, uh, if it is P3, right, and then if the location, assess by assess the patient and discuss with patient. If the patient is willing, you can go for breast conservation and uh, if patient is not putting psychological experience, you can remove, but in the Western trend is what was breast conservation, right? And reconstruction. If you remove the breast or remove a large part, you do get the soft tissue covering by putting a flap. That soft tissue cover. If you remove part of a soft uh, tissue and get the soft tissue covering by mobilizing soft tissue from somewhere else. That is the idea. Her tumor is positive for both estrogen and progesterone receptors. Explain briefly how this receptor positivity influences tumor behavior and selection of different options of endocrine manipulation. Yes, estrogen is a tricky question. Huh? Uh, yes, good prognosis. Uh, why it is good prognosis? Why these are growth factor receptors? Uh, as uh, evidence suggests you, oh, there are targeted therapy to address these receptors. Uh, there is a good prognosis. You should give the, do the uh, surgical intervention uh, properly in relation to stage. Then uh, do the targeted therapy, right? That is two options, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. Uh, Tamoxifen inhibit the estrogen receptor step itself. Uh, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors prevent the conversion of androgens to estrogen. Right? Then uh, current evidence suggests that aromatase inhibitors are more successful in yes postmenopausal women. Tamoxifen for premenopause. Yes. If you describe those things. You all want to go on detail on this topic, if I can, but almost you have discussed the other day, you know. That is the thing. Uh, these are the points, nothing else, right? If you write all this, you will carry you know, all these marks. This local regional treatment, surgery, mastectomy, and breast conservation, and reconstruction, axilla, you know, axilla clearance, right? Then with regard to this, uh, uh, anything you have missed, just check and move to other topic. Anything you all want to ask on this? Any questions? Uh, 10.50. Systemic therapy, there are three components, endocrine, chemotherapy, and biologic therapy, right? Biological therapy, with regard to Herceptin and Her2 receptor endocrine therapy is the one we are now talking, right? As endocrine therapy. It depends on receptor status, right? There are different, different modalities. We don't want to go that much of detail. To know about this tamoxifen and uh, aromatase inhibitors and action of those things a little bit. That's more than enough at your level, right? The place for surgical oophorectum. A young female. There are worse articles, but uh, we don't do. I haven't encountered, right? There are some research articles on this, but I actually I can't remember. I'll get back to you with that, right? Not in a current practice, no. Maybe they don't have enough evidence, right? For that. Is aromatase inhibitors given only for poor? Yes, most of the time because tamoxifen is available, no? right? More beneficial. Drug is there without any limitations, right? So. Not 
find this. Como vamos a ver ahora, por ahora parece que no se fue, ahora parece que no se fue. That's a very interesting. Okay. Okay, then move on to the next question. Anything you want to ask? Apart from those questions. Okay. Next one. You all can see my uh, this screen, no? Without any disturbance. All this referral, reference notes, huh? There are a few notes I'm taking time and time. Can you all see, see those things also? Yes, nice. Okay, right, right. Okay. 60 year old, next question. 60 year old man presents with a painful unilateral lower limb swelling for three days. Rather acute condition, right? List two possible diagnoses. Just type two possible. What are your two possible diagnoses? Yes. Those are the most. Uh, DVT and cellular group plan. Yeah, good, good. DVT and cellulitis. Those are the differential diagnosis you should exclude higher up in the ladder, right? Uh, explain briefly how would you clinically differentiate between these two possible. Important uh, clinical ter uh, term is here clinical. Clinical means history and examination, not the investigation, right? How do you clinically differentiate between these two possibilities, right? In Cellulitis, what happens there? There's a soft tissue infection, right? The inflammation going on due to uh, bacterial infection, right? As there are three diagnoses, can you say lymphedema? Not rather acute state. You can say ruptured Baker's is rather acute part, no? And then, uh, yes. Rather than lymphedema, lymphedema you won't develop like this. Yes, you can mention, but not the best with you to go with, right? All right. Uh, inflammatory, someone mentioned inflammatory signs. Yeah, inflammatory, what else is there before signs? History, there will be a Triggering factor, as I said, there is anatomical, pathological, and etiology. There should be etiology, either minute trauma, right? Either patient is immunocompromised state, diabetes patient, with a di deformed foot, diabetic foot, right? Or is there, there will be any triggering uh, conditions which leads to past history of cellulitis, any uh, Past history of this uh, even cellulitis. All these are okay. All these are triggering factors for inflammation. You can elicit those things, right? Uh, in the history, especially systemic inflammatory features, fever, high fever, right? Uh, then uh, inflammatory features. In the history there will be uh, these. Etiology, minor trauma, immunocompromised states, uh, systemic inflammatory features. If it is complicated, if the uh, uh, patient is complicated with this uh, cellulitis, uh, if you uh, think this infection is azim through the veins, they will get thrombophlebitis and inguinal. If they will again complain of this uh, uh, pain in inguinal region as well, erythema and everything in inguinal region. And along the veins, right? Those things they will uh, even complain history, right? And uh, uh, yes, systemic features. And if it is complete sepsis, again, the patient will be really ill. In a DVT, the uh, in the examination in cellulitis, there will be again. Blister formations, right? Acute inflammatory features are very profound, very significant. Erythema, erythema, uh, 
tenderness, they will be in the same, um, in the, both the conditions, there will be tenderness. It, warmth is very high in cellulite when compared to DVD, right? Uh, erythema is very prominent, you can say. Uh, then uh, disability, both the conditions will carry disability. Uh, selling also both the conditions carry, right? And uh, in the examination, there will be uh, this ingrowing toenails, uh, fungal infections, web spaces, deformed foot, diabetic charcoal foot, everything, which leads to minor trauma in cellulite, right? And diabetic ulcers, right? Chronic ulcers, those are contributing factors of cellulite, right? Uh, that is in, in the examination. And you will feel this thrombose superficial veins and inguinal lymphadenopathy will be there in the uh, cellulitis and there will be systemic uh, signs due to sepsis if it is a systemic uh, if it is if it, if it is a, if uh, it has go go beyond the local state local regional state if it, if it has spread to systemic circulation there will be cystic manifestation hypotension breathing disney those things will be there right but you have to, you just mentioned factors in history and examination to differentiate, right? That is that in the, when it comes to DVT, there will be a, again contributing factors. Etiology will be there, right? Hypercoagulable states, prolonged immobilization, fractures, trauma, then patient is bed bound for a long duration. Then uh, major surgeries, recently done major surgeries, right? Then patient is having ongoing malignancy, patient who has undergone radiotherapy, right? Patient who is on hystrogenic states, right? Pregnancy, OCP, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, there will be trigger impact, risk factors in the history you can elicit, right? And in the examination, there will be significant calf tenderness, right? Uh, these inflammatory features will be absent. No, you won't find lymphangitis, lymphadenopathy, right? blister formation, eruption. Those are those won't be found in DVT usually. But as always, these conditions can coexist, right? That is why in DVT patients, if you have suspicion, we do a venous suplex and assess the deep venous system to exclude DVT. Because DVT leg is more or less when you uh, have the gross outlook similar, right? The exact is clear, uh, very comprehensive history and examination will exclude this, right? Right. Those carries thirty marks. Uh, you know this uh, DVT thing. Do I have a presentation? There is another presentation. Little bit of DVD as a common condition, right? Uh, those are the DDs for activity swollen limb. DVT, erysipelas, ruptured bacrosis, cellulitis, muscle rupture, and lymphedema in the lower down, right? Someone has asked about that. Uh, risk factors again age, old age, immobilization, surgery, trauma, malignancy, hypercoagulous state, family history, OCP, pregnancy, obese patient, right? And this. Conditions. And there's a clinical lesion well score, right? Uh, just go through this. So, again, we don't usually practice, but just mention that we can check the factors in uh, factors which are mentioned in well scan. 
if this square is if this goes less than two, it's low risk. The more square is more than two, it's high risk, right? Uh, what is DVT? That is the other thing. Huh? How how does it occur? Thrombosis occurs. There are three contributing factors according to virtual studies: stasis of the blood, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulation. It's a dynamic condition, result from a combination of risk factors that shift the balance of coagulation to hypercoagulation. It's always equilibrium between coagulation and anticoagulation, right? In the body, these all the risk factors this, uh, pushes this equilibrium between hypercoagulation, uh, coagulation, and anticoagulation equilibrium more towards coagulation side right there are coagulation factors in that at the same time anticoagulation factors in that all these interactions will maintain blood in a flowing state but if there are there are factors which disturb this equilibrium this will push the blood into more hyper uh, coagulable state rather than anti uh, anticoagulation right so patient will develop thrombosis right Thrombosis can uh, occur in calf pains and it can progress up to popliteal vein, femoral, and in a worse scenario, it can lead to uh, arterial compromisation of arterial supply, lead to severe venous occlusion. Entire venous occlusion will lead to uh, engorgement of arteries, and artery supply will be cut off, and patient, patient will develop ischemic clay, pale ischemic clay. That is called phlegmatic cerebellar alba. Then become the cyanose, the venous condition, um, gangrene, is, that is called phlegmatic cerulea dolens, right? Right, that's it for the DVT. Uh, uh, yes. Two days later, his heart rate was 110 per minute, right? Respiratory rate. Is 20 per minute. Blood pressure is 90 by 70. Explain how each of these conditions, Mr. in 4.1, can lead to physiologic disturbances. Describe. Any answer for this? Acute limb ischemia as a DD. Painful unilateral limb swelling. Just in acute limb ischemia, you won't get much swelling, right? You, do, you don't get swelling. It's, what are the features of acute in this schema? Six P's. Right? Pain, uh, paresthesia, excruciating pain, ischemic pain, paresthesia, paralysis, pain, pulselessness, and uh, perishing cold. Those are six features. Not see, swelling is minor, right? It's a good question anyway. Someone has asked whether we can take uh, acute limb ischemia as a DD. First question. It's not right. Not the not the correct DD when it comes to limb cell. Yes, in chronic limb ischemia, they will develop some degree of mild ankle cell, but not the entirely, right? Are you clear? Yes, they are, you all have mentioned sepsis. Yeah, what else? A septic shock. This is a, not only sepsis. This is septic shock, right? Patient's blood pressure is dropped. Respiratory rate is high. Tachycardia. It's, it's a shock. It can be septic shock if it is cellulitis. What happens in DVT? DVT goes in here. Yes, pulmonary embolism. What, is, what sort of shock is that? Septic shock is... That is a distributive shock, vaso dilatation due to this. What is septicemia? That is dysregulated host immune response to systemic infection. So, due to this cytokine activity and systemic inflammation, vaso, there will be a vaso dilatation. So, the uh, uh, blood volume for this uh, dilated vascular system is relatively low. Even the volume is normal, this vascular is dilated. So it is a uh, relatively 
relative reduction of the volume when it comes to the, the enlarged vascular vascular system so it is a dis in pulmonary embolism this thrombus shoot up and go to the ivc and comes to right heart goes and obstruct the pulmonary vasculature right if it is a minor minor thrombus it will obstruct pulmonary capillaries pulmonary capillaries otherwise this is saddle embolus it can just uh, obstruct the pulmonary trunk as well right patient will get develop sudden death here it's different uh, in the in this if it is dvt he has developed pulmonary embolism right ongoing obstructive show right heart failure with obstruction right but blood flow won't comes through the lung and it is obstruction of degree of obstruction there will be pulmonary hypertension there will be vq mismatch right perfusion is less when even though patient breathe, breathe there will be less perfusion to alveolar and patient is uh, hypoxic so the heart rate is rising and blood pressure is low due to this obstructive shock this obstruction in the pulmonary vasculature so the blood pressure is low there is sympathetic activity due to this barrow receptor and chemo receptor stimulation and patient is take out the septicemia again hypertension due to vasodilatation and uh, uh vasodilatation blood pressure is low uh, uh blood pressure is determined by cardiac output and peripheral vascular system if peripheral vascular system is reduced due to uh, vasodilatation and barrow receptor chemo receptor stimulation again leads to tachycardia and in septicemia there will be a septic shock there will be a, I mean, anyway, like it is, it is a shock, a septic shock, and if it is infection also, there will be a acidotic part, and patient will be take uh, uh, to uh, compensate the acidotic uh, acidotic uh, metabolic acidosis, right? That is the respiratory compensation. That is how you describe the respiratory rate, right? in two of these conditions right you can just work it out and describe nice right you will describe better than me even. right that is the if you have the knowledge you can describe a good flow you will get the you will that is the aspect you have to touch right giving the reasons this five investigations you would arrange to distinguish between possibilities Studying 4.1, giving the reason list, you list the reason with explanation, some degree of explanation, right? This, this, uh, this commands in the this key key terms in the question is very important, right? That is that is what makes the difference between knowledge and exam oriented approach. Sometimes people are very knowledgeable, they tend to still they tend to score. Low marks because they won't answer the question. Right? Okay. Five investigations. What are the five investigations? The range of distinguish. And we have. You should be able to differentiate. There are two possible uh, uh, investigation again. What is the objective? Taking a history. You have to confirm the diagnosis. That means exclude the differentials. Then look for the. Complications and in the surgical setup, assess the fitness of surgery. Examination also again same. Confirm the diagnosis and look for the complications. In investigation also again confirm the diagnosis and look for the complications. Right? And say how do you choose five investigations which differentiate uh, these two conditions? One thing you said cellulitis, inflammation and infection is more profound. So you do the inflammatory markers. Full blood count CRP is high. WBC with neutrophilic count and CRP will be higher in what cellulitis, right? Then another investigations DVT. How do you DVT in when it comes to DVT? Doppler study, venous duplex and D diamonds, right? You can. 
Do the dimers as well. Less than three still you can do, right? And uh, Venus suplex, you do the, you assess the compressibility of the veins and which level the thrombosis is there. Yeah, it is only half veins, and it's just more complete here, a bit more, right? Venus suplex of the lower limb. Then you can do a blood culture and urine culture. If it is a disseminated infection, you can do a culture to differentiate. I'm doing this, uh, I'm mentioning blood cultures and urine cultures as this question says to distinguish between possibilities. Doing ABG won't differentiate no? these two conditions unless it is complicated with septicemia or pulmonary embolism. Doing ABG won't help you differentiate, right? If it is a compromised state, the respiratory compromisation, yes, you should do the ABG level. You want septicemia, yes, you should do. Right? That is to that is to help you help your management and assess the severity. How is your in culture? Usually we don't uh, gain much if it is cellulitis. In any infection, when you send cultures, we send both, no, and not only in the, in the cellulitis, if there's a wound, definitely you should send so wound soap cultures rather than urine culture, right? You should mention wound soap cultures. The blister fluid, you aspirate at center for culture. The blister formation, you aspirate the blister center for culture. If there are wounds, wounds of culture it is. And if you do a wound or tissue, you can send tissue for wound culture, uh, tissue for cultures, then blood culture. That is the best cultures. And urine culture, when it comes to this question, is not relevant. But as usual practice, we send all these, right? Otherwise, microbiology will ask you for your for an answer whether you have sent a urine culture. Right? If you in the septicemia occurs, you don't know where the exact focus is, so you exclude everything. Right. Those are the five investigations you can do the research, right? Clear now? I've completed four questions by 11.15. Happy, you know? Right? I've got, we took extra time for. Can you do chest x ray to differentiate permeabilism? Why? What is the reason for do, doing chest x ray to differentiate cellulitis? No, here they are asked to list the investigation to differentiate the condition you mentioned in the 4.1. They are just now you have to forget again this respiratory rate, this complication that is. Go on. Now again, they go back to 4.1. You have to investigate this unilateral limb swing. Nothing, nothing about this uh, respiratory rate, uh, there is a viral embolism of the septic, septic shock, right? Are you clear? Okay. All right. MR, MRA. Why do you assess arteries? No point, right? We do the venous reflex and very, it's very sensitive. Venous reflex is very sensitive to diagnose DV, right? You will do these hi fi angiograms versus arterial disease. CT angiogram, MR angiogram, right? Next question. Any questions on that? Oh, I shall move on to question number five. Too speed, too slow. What is, what is the idea? Am I rushing through, or you do, do you all want to discuss more? All right. Okay. Next question. Anyone to answer this? You may, you may feel sleepy by now. Right. Anyone to come and talk to just to give a momentum for this talk, otherwise one sided talking won't help. If you all there are no right or wrong answers, right? The best way to get the maximum benefit is come and answer. 
you won't lose anything rather you gain something anyone to ask the discussion anyone okay right uh, you can finish by the way sir uh, right we move on we move on constitutional symptoms what do you mean by this i didn't get your complications of spread are you answering discussion All right okay 70 year old female presents with left lower quadrant abdominal pain for three months the duration is three months right age is 70 and left lower quadrant pain yeah okay this is the clinical features that would suggest large bowel malignancy right colorectal carcinoma is a hot topic in surgery very hot topic right we encounter this uh, long cases of service fragging uh, is SCQs wherever you go colorectal carcinoma will come behind you as your thyroid and breast right just we'll just go through this Mm. Right. Uh, this low seventy-year-old female with a left lower quadrant pain for three months. Rather, uh, uh, what are what is the question here? Yeah. Uh, clinical features, right? Clinical features means history and examination both. So, clinical features again, history. With relation to local regional disease and with relation to metastasis, examination findings again with related to local regional disease and uh, metastasis, right? It will carry 10 marks per each examination findings and uh, history, right? Or then history, altered bowel habits, right? Tenismus, spurious diarrhea. Right, uh, perrectal bleeding. Then, uh, what else? All this is uh, gives a uh, this idea about uh, features of bowel obstruction. Right, all this you rise to local regional disease. Then, uh, local disease. Right, then it can invade the surrounding structures and you rise some other symptoms. Fecal urea, pneumaturia, ureteric uh, colic due to ureteric obstruction, right? It can invade the ureter, in the left uh, lower quadrant, left, it could be left uh, descending colon tumor, sigmoid colon, or even upper rectum, right? All this uh, uh, can be, uh, all these pathologies lead to different symptoms. Uh, it could be due to either local obstruction, local tumor with obstruction, or invading surrounding structure. If there is an obstruction, you will get a, a, a distant bowel, bowel loops, right? Abdominal distension, right? Then if it is a tumor with necrosis, you will get PR bleeding, right? Anyway, tumors will necrose, no? uh, fragile epithelium, you will get PR bleeding. And Constipation and intermittent diarrhea. This is spurious diarrhea. If it is sigmoid uh, colon tumor with uh, obstruction, narrowing of the uh, canal, uh, GI tract, lumen, there will be a stool congestion proximal to the tumor and it will be liquefied by bacteria reaction. Patient, after few days of a constipation, develop a sudden diarrhea. That is spurious diarrhea. Then, low uh, rectal tumors will you rise to tenismus. Tenismus means you strain and try to evacuate, but end up with futile defecation, right? Due to this space occupy lesion and stimulation rectum, rectal receptor, right? All these are uh, symptoms related to local regional disease. We are bleeding, tenismus, sense of incomplete evacuation, all of these, uh, these symptoms due to local disease, tumor. And if it is involved in the sphincter incontinence, right? Mucus discharge, altered bowel habits, 
If it is obstructed, you will get colicky pain and distension, right? Then, if it is uh, uh, complicated uh, with uh, bowel obstruction, they will give a pieces of bowel obstruction. In left colonic humus more uh, common to develop uh, bowel obstruction rather than right colonic humus. Right colonic humus they present with anemia, right? And you, you can assess the anemic features as well, as there will be, on, will be ongoing PR bleeding. So you can assess the uh, features it's related, to, it's related to complications, right? Then the uh, uh, it's, it's, then you have to uh, look for symptoms which gives by local spread. If the, this local uh, tumor is spread to bladder, it will develop fecal urine even too. If it is spread laterally and involving ureter, they will develop obstruction and they will develop uh, this ureteric colics, right? And if it is involved sacral plexus, they will get intractable backache. Right, and this impotence, bilateral volume, numbness, pain, all these distincting nodes again develop incontinence. And if they have metastasis, they will get uh, if they have liver meds, cancer symptoms, jaundice, uh, right upper pain. If it is a lung meds, hemoptysis, respiratory difficulties, shortness of breath, brain comes with present with space of open lesions, no? early morning headache, it's because of increased ICP. Right and fits, right? Weaknesses. If it's bone, if it is involved in bone, just severe bone pain, intractable back aches, right? Pathological fractures, all this. Those so you have to elicit symptoms with related to local disease, uh, luminal obstructions, all these uh, with uh, symptoms with regard to location of the tumor, then local inhalation, then Symptoms which occur due to distance. Again, examination, you will look into those things, right? Uh, doing a DR, uh, look for this tumor. Is it a circumferential tumor? Uh, what is the consistency? Hard or smooth? What, whether the mucosa is movable or not? Uh, whether you can get, what is the distance from the anal verge? Like whether you can get above the lump, uh, whether it is confined to rectum or whether it is higher, it continues, right? Then, what is the sphincter tone? Is there a sphincter tumor and if sphincter in uh, relaxation, right? Uh, if it is a sacral nerve involvement, again, they will get uh, this uh, lax sphincters. And when you draw the finger out, there's a contact bleeding, which is also a sign of this fragile epithelium necros tumors and all this, right? And abdominal exam, you look for lower left lower quadrant tumors, palpable tumors, then it comes with more colon, larger tumors, you can feel. Then, if it is a uh, metastasis disease with diabetes, look for ascites, uh, hepatic uh, tendons are right upper quadrant, palpable he liver, hepatomegaly, oscillated the uh, lungs for effusion, right? Any weaknesses with regards to brain mates, right? Uh, and any fractures, all these should be done in examination as well. You should uh, write all these features in this question. The carries only 20 marks, history and examination features. You should mention, mention with little large bowel malignancies, right? This is specific when it comes to question. Left colonic tumor, this can be symptom, right? And again, meds, uh, local region involvement, metastatic diseases, yes, same. And again, features related to this DRE examination, abdominal examination, and it's related to the malignant. You can just list, right? That is the clinical features of history and exam examination. You should only mention. When it comes to clinical assessment, only mention history and examination features, no investigation, right? Giving reasons, list three investigations you to perform on this patient, establish the diagnosis and stage the disease. 
right that part is very important establish the disease diagnose establish the diagnosis stage the disease yes what are there hydronephrosis double kidney yes family history yeah Yeah. This is yeah. Go on, go on, answer. Yeah. No. All right. Good. Trans rectal ultrasound scan. Yes, that is true. These are local invasion, right? In, the, in this uh, with regard to this question, we are talking about the sigmoid colon, not a colonic thing. Large bowel lines, yeah, rectum is included. Anyway, giving reasons, this three investigations, right? So you should think about the three investigations to establish the diagnosis and stage the disease. First investigation, I would say, is colonoscopy, full colonoscopy. And biopsy, right? In colonoscopy, you can identify a tumor if there's a tumor. According to this history, there will be a, uh, left colonic involvement, left lower quarter, sigmoid colon, or lower descending colon, or rectum, right? With the appearance, you can think whether it is malignant or benign, polypoidal growth with necrosis, bleeding, right? You can. With from the look at, look itself, you can uh, think, right? Then you have to take the biopsy and send for the histology. Multiple biopsies should be taken and sent for histology. That will give the histological diagnosis. And if you can negotiate the, this obstruction, there will be obstruction due to tumor, you should go up to the seeker and screen entire colon, look for synchronous lesion, right? Because you miss a there are seven percent chances of synchronous lesion. If you miss synchronous lesion, there will be recurrence, right? This is a full colonoscopy and biopsy. And we, that is the reason of doing colonoscopy. Another thing is uh, is a surgical factor. When you do go to the seeker to confirm that you have gone to the seeker, you have to intubate ileum as well. That is the current practice, ileal intubation. And when you withdraw the scope, that is the point where you look for this lesion rather than insert it. Because withdrawal time should be six to seven minutes. And you go to this, you negotiate uh, this splenic flex, rectal sigmoid junction, uh, splenic flexure, uh, hepatic flexure, and go to the cecum. Then you uh, 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 go to the ileum if it is possible. Then when you withdraw the scope, from the cecum up to rectum, that is the point where you can notice the lesion, uh, right? So withdrawal time should be, when you do the colonoscopy, withdrawal time of the scope should be seven to eight minutes, right? Uh, next investigation is to state this is yes, CC, contrast in the CT, uh, abdomen and pelvis, depends on the symptoms, you can say you will go for chest. So, right? And uh, that is to state the disease, right? And next thing is if it is a rectal tumor, yes. Transrectal ultrasound scan is important to assess the local invasion. And MRI is far, anyway, uh, uh, far better to assess the recto, this mesorectal tissue plane, right? Right? Mesorectal tissue. But here, since they are doing large bowel malignancy, it's a bit unspecific. Un they haven't specified, right? Large bowel malignancy, colorectal tumors, colonic tumors, and rectal tumors. So uh, there's a place for stool occult blood, right? Since this patient is history is given as abdominal pain, only abdominal pain. Uh, in history, they, they haven't given, they haven't mentioned about any PR bleeding or anything, right? Only the pain. So, 
if, if the PR rating is not uh, uh, obvious, you do, is, is there any, any macroscopic bleeding? You look for microscopic bleeding, right? It's true local blood, there is help to control, yes. Uh, because that uh, not really for the confirmation, it's true local blood positivity is an indication for colonoscopy, right? So when it was three investigation, you can mention either stool local blood, and even you mentioned transrectal ultrasound, and MRI rectum. That is also right. But if it is a if a colonic, this descending colon or sigmoid colon tumor, you won't do this MRI and trans colonic ultrasound. We don't do right because in local we look we do uh, we assess the local invasion in a very uh, high threshold in rectum, rectal cancer, because we have preserved a lot of structures, right, in the rectal region, compact space. No? So you have to assess the local invasion and stage disease properly to decide the surgical intervention and neoadjuvant therapy. But when it comes to sigmoid colon or descending colon, you don't have nothing much to preserve. You can dissect the colon, right? So you won't uh, bother much about uh, this. Uh, uh, to assess the local invasion in high threshold by doing an endoscopic ultrasound scan. You can assess it by DC. So, my, for my thought process, I will include this, uh, this true local blood because this question is this non specific. Uh, and there's a so this MRI and rectal carcinoma. So we will give marks anyway, right? Don't worry. Investigations confirm the carcinoma of the sigmoid colon. Right. Outline, how would you prepare this patient for collection? Right. We have extensively discussed about patient preparing for surgery. Same thing will be done in this patient as well. Right. And that part I won't mention. So you should assess the fitness for surgery, optimize the comorbids. Everything should be do as same as for any patient. But specifically this disease condition, we have to think about special factors, right? Very specific factors. What are those? Hmm? One thing, right? Is uh, whether this patient will be ended up with a uh, colostomy or not? Yes, exactly. Right, there's a risk of if you can't get an uh, if you can't do a primary anastomosis and do an anastomosis of resection, right? Patient will end up in uh, either permanent or temporary colostomy, right? That part has to be addressed preoperatively, right? Uh, this patient preparation in relation to diet, right? This ad uh, advises. To the patient regarding colostomy care, and we are uh, where are this uh, colostomy bag is hang up, right? How do you position this, and how do you clean this? What are the advantages and disadvantages of colostomy? Everything should be uh, explained. We should obtain the consent, right? Uh, anyway, for the surgery, we take informed consent. Apart from that. We should mention about colostomy in the consent. Okay. Patient should be educated about colostomy care and dietary modification. And uh, at the same time, we should get the consent for colostomy. If it, uh, if it is needed, we'll do, go for colostomy. Right? That is not happened always. But lower rectal cancers, if you go for API, anyway, you will end, uh, patient will be ended up with permanent colostomy. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you can't go for a primary anastomosis due to unhealthy bowel, we'll go for a temporary. Assume that patient is complicated with bowel obstruction due to tumor, right? Bowel volar congested. You remove the uh, tumor with adequate margin, still, you can't anastomose with congested bowel. You uh, take the bowel out from the abdominal wall and leave it there. Address the uh, 
uh, this malignancy is a given tumor radio, then go for reverse, right? That's how we do. Okay. And uh, and uh, other thing is, uh, what are the other bowel preparation? That's a, another hot topic. According to ERAS, we don't do mechanical preparation. We do the put an enema uh, on the uh, day of, morning of the day of the surgery and go for surgery. For the ERAS protocol, but now the uh, world is moving to towards again, world is moving towards full bowel preparation. Right? Disadvantages of bowel preparation is electrolyte imbalances, dehydration, right? neutral deployment. Long fasting early. Having said that, it uh, it uh, e is uh, bowel preparation will ease the surgeon, right? Anastomosis will be easy because assume uh, this contaminated bowel is fecal matter, very difficult to go surgeon, right? Uh, this is a hot topic. This bowel preparation, colostomy. What else? Mm. If you go into prepare, you can say bowel preparation is the current trend, even though ERAS mentioned, not, uh, even uh, ERAS discourages bowel preparation. Now, world is moving towards bowel preparation. Uh, we can advise the patient to take low fiber diet for three days and give laxatives on the pre, uh, day before surgery and go for a uh, mechanical bowel preparation, right? Then uh, marking the stoma. The stoma site should be marked, right? Before sending to the theater. So avoid skin lines, right? And some senior person who is maybe who is doing the surgery or senior person should be should mark the colostomy site, right? Then this is the major surgery, yes. Uh, ICU care may need that should be discussed with uh, uh, anesthetist and better preserve ICU bed if it is needed, right? And uh, other everything is really out of PO assessment you have respiratory, CVS, uh, renal, as we mentioned, nutrition, everything should be mentioned. I am not going to mention those factors because we have discussed everything in the uh, previous uh, question, right? So you have to mention all these things with and specifically the uh, condition uh, fact, uh, points which related to this surgery. Okay. Uh, and with regard to anesthesia, again, we have discussed this DVD prophylaxis, stopping anticoagulants and uh, fasting. Nutrition, everything should be addressed, right? So it should be things should be mentioned. And with regard to fasting, ERAS protocol says uh, six hours fa fasting for solids, two hours fasting for liquids. We discourage prolonged fasting, right? And preoperative uh, glucose loading. That means uh, we encourage patient to take uh, glucose uh, solutions. Till, until two hours before surgery, right? Those will enhance the record, right? Uh, what else? Then we have uh, talked about consent. And before sending the patient to theater, you should catheterize because you are entering to the uh, abdominal cavity, whether it is a laparoscopic surgery or open surgery. If, we, if the bladder is distended, uh, it will be difficult. To dissect, right? So that should, that should be decompressed at the same time. Catheterization will is the patient for uh, is the anesthetic for monitoring, right? And uh, yes, prophylactic antibiotics. Everything we have mentioned in this uh, previous question, right? Factors related to patient, factors factors related to uh, anesthesia and surgery. Everything should be. The same classification. It is scrub bath, not uh, indicated in this situation. We don't do colectomy, maybe 
you do in private sector. I don't know about uh, your faculty teaching. You don't usually do, right? Right, unless you do a neurosurgery or cardiac surgery. We are entering into gut, no? Then, uh, those are the factors I roughly mentioned. In what striking features is this colostomy. That is what they are mostly concerned. Colostomy, the consent and education of the colostomy and uh, consent for that. Bowel preparation, that is a doubtful topic. Then, this fasting, catheterization, uh, tending the theater list, all these are just as for any surgery, right? Right? And this important factor here is, uh, is bowel preparation, stoma, care, education, counseling. And it's a big trauma for pa the patient, right? The patient who has defecated uh, uh, throughout his life now ended up with a colostomy. It's a big trauma. You have to uh, clearly explain the advantage of this doing this surgery and how well patients are now performing it for colostomy, right? You are, you are uh, uh, deciding the colostomy site, which is going to permanent colostomy, uh, the lower part of the abdomen that will be covered by your dressing, right? It's if you train to do the colostomy cleaning and colostomy bag, uh, this removal and reapply, it's going to be a uh, near normal life. Right, so you have to give a positive uh, influence of the patient and talk to the patient, get the consent. Okay, right, okay, moving to the last question 15 minutes more. We'll just rush through. If you all have any questions, any doubts, happy to clarify. You can just uh, text me or drop a message, whatever, right. 30 year old motorcyclist involved in a road traffic crash. Admitted to the emergency ward with history of pain, deformity, grossly swollen right thigh, with overlying skin bruising. Extremities were cold, pedal pulses were absent. Heart rate was 120 per minute. Blood pressure is 80 by 6. Fully conscious. Patients fully conscious. Giving reasons, estimate the blood loss. Anyone to answer this? When when do we restart feeding after surgery? After six hours or after bowel sounds appear? Yes, this bowel sounds thing is a very very gross assessment. Now we don't wait till bowel sounds appear, right? When the patient is fully recovered, uh, usually if it is anastomosis. If the bowel analysis will wait for 24 hours, possible day one, we start, right? After we start with the clear liquids and gradually we increase, right? Uh, nothing to do with bowel sounds now. That is, no, it's gone. Right. Uh, how do you estimate blood loss? What do you know about hypolemic shock and uh, what is this condition in anyway? it? Give me the complete diagnosis. Yes, we can type complete diagnosis. Okay, according to clinical picture. Anyone to answer? Anyone? Class three hemorrhagic shock due to fracture fear. Exactly, yes. So if you can further specify. Class three hemorrhagic shock due to close fracture right side, yeah, right demo, right side fracture fear. Right. Okay. Uh, so, what is the blood loss in class three hemorrhagic shock? What happens in what is the blood loss in uh, class one, class two, class three, and class four? Fifteen percent, fifteen to thirty, thirty to forty, and more than 40, right? 30 to 40 means roughly 1.5 to 4, 2 liters in a 20 kilogram 
body weight person, right? Usually, seven percent of the body weight is the your intrastitular blood volume, roughly five liters, right? Expected uh, seven hundred fifty. Milliliter blood loss in class one shock. Uh, 750 to 1.5 liters in class two, 1.5 liters two in class three, and even that in class four, right? So you want to refresh your hemorrhagic show, or you can you just do the just do the this thing. Any, any time we can discuss, right? Explain the above clinical observation. Yes, there is a trauma patient with a possible fracture frame and expect blood loss due to fracture itself and there can be a hidden vascular injury due to this fracture. Femoral artery may be torn or dissected or femoral vein as well, right? We don't know because fetal pulses were absent due to hypolemia. Yes, once you resuscitate, you again Palpate the right uh, uh, lower limb distal pulse and look for distal pulses. So even pedal pulses, you go proximally, distal fracture, popular pulse, feel for it, and look for the pulses are there to extra vascular injury. Right? Uh, extra could be the blood loss due to fracture femur itself and can be uh, torn vascular injury as well. There can be hidden vascular injury. So there's a blood loss due to hypovolemia. Right, is it, uh, is it already so grade three blood loss, uh, uh, blood pressure will be uh, dropped. So, there will be a baroreceptor and chemoreceptor stimulation and sympathetic core activity, stimulate the heart as a compensation, and there will be a tachycardia. Uh, and sympathetic core activity leads to peripheral. Uh, it is a redistribution of blood from non vital organs to vital organs, right? This will blood will redistribute from skin, gut, kidneys, and uh, that will distribute to heart, uh, brain, and uh, heart, brain, and liver, right? Uh, So due to this redistribution, cutaneous vasoconstriction, uh, patient will get distal vasoconstriction. Cutaneous vasoconstriction, the patient will get uh, cold, clammy hands and skin. This uh, peripheral vasoconstriction, and again, uh, due to sympathetic core activity, there will be a peripheral vasoconstriction to increase the uh, afterload, right? To overcome this uh, hypertension. All these lead to Diminish distal pulses. In the hypolemic shock state, no point of palpating distal pulse to check whether the patient is alive, right? You have to pulse, feel central pulses. Most of the time, uh, in the emergency department, patient, we are called to see absent distal pulses and they do vascular referral in a hypolemic patient without resuscitation. They suspect vascular injuries. Without resuscitation, and once you resuscitate, this fetal pulses, this distal pulses will be palpable. Okay. Uh, that is the explanation. 30 marks now, each uh, cold climbing uh, peripheries, pulses are absent, uh, and the uh, heart rate is rising, and blood pressure is low. All this has been explained. Then, clinical observation. This uh, history of pain, deformity, and rosicol and tie skin bruising due to possible underlying femur fracture. That has to be explained as well. Due to this femur fracture, there is a femur is long bone, it's blood loss, blood loss uh, due to femur fracture per se is 1.52 liters. There will be a uh, blood accumulation in the muscle compartments, and there will be a surrounding soft tissue injury, muscle injury, vascular injury as well. And all this bleeding within the tight compartment will lead to swollen right thigh. The skin bruising may be due to uh, damage, direct trauma, right? And pain uh, due to this uh, 
fracture and hematoma, right? All these clinical observations should be explained. Uh, deformity, the right thigh, uh, this cold extremities, absent pulses, heart rate, blood pressure. Right? Outline the emergency management. You see, is you know blood, bread and butter thing. Resuscitation, any trauma patient, airway and C spine, breathing. Circulation, here circulation is more important. This patient is in grade three shock. Uh, for, uh, get the IE access, take the blood for investigations, basic investigation and grouping and cross match. Large book, we have to and get the large book cannula. If you can't then, uh, do the peripheral cannulation, cannulation, try it twice, no more, the, no more than that. Go for central cannulation, central line. Give IV fluids, IV fluid resuscitation. One point of maximum is one point five liters. And grade three shock. This is a definitive indication of blood. Get the blood ready and transfuse, right? Uh, and uh, depending on the response, you can decide whether this patient is having massive transfusion as well. If it is a, if this patient is poor responding, activate massive transfusion protocol. That means to replace. Uh, massive transfusion means you uh, expect uh, blood resuscitation with uh, 12, 10, 10, more than 10 minutes of uh, red, black red cells, right? Or full volume transfusion. Or if you are going to uh, transfuse, uh, uh, I think, one third of the full volume within three hours or so, right? So uh, that blood transfusion at the same time, uh, this lethal trial should be at, uh, addressed. Uh, hypothermia, uh, hypoxia, and acidosis, right? Uh, and then place of tranexamic acid in the trauma situation is one gram, IV tranexamic is one gram, bolus is in 10 minutes and Infusion of eight hours. That is a, that is a proven for proven, that is a proven benefit, and that will prevent uh, patients' death rate due to bleeding. Right? It's ongoing bleeding. You have tranexamic acid. What else? Uh, see, then look for disability. If patient is conscious. Uh, they expose and look for the injuries. And secondary survey again, head to toe to exclude any other injuries, right? Yes, catheterization is important. Yes, in the hypoline state, uh, that is for that is to assess the response, right? Monitoring urine output. And this fluid recitation and blood pressure, all are goal directed. There's a place of tourniquet. How do we say conceal bleeding, right? Conceal bleeding, you have no point of putting a tourniquet to stop this bleeding. If there's external bleeding, you if you can't uh, prevent by direct pressure, yes, there's a place for tourniquet, but it's the last option, right? Uh, in a trauma situation, uh, hypo, hypotensions, hypo, uh, hypotension in a trauma setup, unless true and otherwise. Hypolemic shock, right? Uh, then reasons for bleeding in trauma situations is one in the flow and four more. One in the flow means external bleeding, four more means chest trauma, large uh, hemothorax, abdominal visceral injury, right? Uh, and vascular injury, pelvic fractures and pelvic injuries, and long bone fractures. Here comes in long bone fracture. Those are the five things. You should exclude in a trauma setup. Hypolemic, hypotension in a trauma setup, unless true, otherwise, hypovolemic shock. Don't think about this uh, fancy diagnosis as spinal uh, shock or spinal injuries. Yes, there's a place, but unless true, otherwise, spinal, uh, you can say this is a, a distributed shock due to spinal injury by exclusion, diagnosis or exclusion. If the patient is not responding to fluid, yes. You can say it like that.
and stabilization the fracture there's a fracture you can put a backstab or spleen right and you reassess the pulse status of that limb after resuscitation right and always gold ray fluid therapy and blood transfusion and uh, and the image setup yes there's a place for abg and uh, now this coagulation coagulopathy is there no? there's a risk of coagulopathy hemodilution coagulopathy uh, lethal what is lethal trial coagulopathy hypothermia and acidosis no on the hypoxia and there is uh, uh, this uh, acidosis can be assessed by this uh, abg and coagulopathy uh, now the current trend is we do PT and an APT because this rotum takes 40 minutes. So you can't take quick uh, uh, values. If you send, uh, send the blood sample now to assess, to get the results, it will take 40 minutes. That means a very big part of the situation is gone. You are assessing the blood situation of patient 40 minutes ago. No point in the trauma situation, right? Rotum. And uh, uh, this Pain relief, immobilization fracture, reassessment, all this comes in the emergency management as well. Right? And then definitive care, just after stabilization, you take x rays. In this setup, x ray right femur, AP and lateral with uh, proximal and distal joints, hip joint and knee joint, because any fracture, you should. Take the fracture site with proximal and distal joints, right? Uh, that is the rule of two. And two views, two joints, two equations, right? All, all the principles. And apart from that, according to the primary and secondary survey, if you suspect any other injury, you should order investigation, right? And uh, regarding definitive care, you should exclude uh, a full injury by clinical examination. If you have a really doubt, uh, clinical examination means distal pulses. If it is a vascular injury, despite of hesitation, limb will be skinny, cold limb. Uh, there will be uh, cold planetary for his absent pulses, right? All this paresthesia, paralysis, uh, pain in the lower calf, distal pain, not on the fracture side. All this will be manifested. So there will be acute uh, features of acute limb ischemia due to uh, vascular injury. Uh, if you have a suspicion, you can do a CT angiogram, right? Or if uh, CT angiogram, or if it is an emergency, uh, if there are fractures in multiple levels, you have to assess where is the vascular injury. If there are if there are fractures in two, three uh, levels of femur, for you to do the vascular repair, you should exactly know where is the vascular injury. You can't just open and see. In that, that setup, there's a place for PT angiogram, right? Uh, uh, if it is a just one one level fracture, no, uh, and you suspect vascular injury, you can just re explore without CT angiogram, right? Right, and uh, that is for the vascular injury. Uh, if there's a nerve injury, yes, you can later repair. Uh, and with regard to fracture, this is a close fracture. Uh, if it is depending on the fracture type, if it is a just a mid shaft fracture, there's a place for this uh, concerted management with uh, fraction, bone fraction, and skin fraction. Uh, but you have to discuss with the orthopedic surgical team and uh, look for open reduction and internal fixation or whether you go for the concerted management. Anyway, for definitive surgery, patient should be stabilized, right? This acute period should be gone. That should be uh, done for you to do a surgery fixation. Rest till you do the fixation, you can uh, put a skin fraction and immobilize the fracture site, right? Uh, is there a place for compartment syndrome in this case? In the thigh, yes, compartment syndrome is there's a possibility. 
uh, uh, but usually it occurs in the leg, but it is huge uh, vascular injury with uh, hematoma. Yes, but not the common thing, right? Uh, we'll just rush through this. Uh, just, uh, I'll just uh, uh, rush through this shock presentation. That will be me. Uh, what's this thing? Uh, in more time now, it's 12. We will discuss in detail about hemorrhagic shock later, right? That is the important topic. And uh, any questions on this? Are you all tired or can you all give me a minute to discuss? Uh, two minutes, like, to discuss uh, this. Uh, more management, acute management. Patient management, trauma. Yes. Yeah, we C spine we discussed, right? Breathing. There are four immediate life threatening conditions tension, pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, gravity, massive pneumothorax, circulation. Uh, Excluding me life threatening conditions is the stage class one, class two, class three, and class four. This clinical manifestation is different, right? Uh, class two, you get tachycardia, class three, tachycardia with uh, in class two, get tachycardia with narrow pulse pressure, class three, tachycardia with reduction of systolic and diastolic blood pressure, class four, tachycardia more than 140, right? That is the st four stages. Color of cannulas, large book, and we usually try to put orange color, right? 14 minutes. IE access and targets of this situation. You will not put more than 0.5 level of consciousness, peripheral pulses, blood pressure. Mean artery pressure, pressure should be at least 55, 60. Right? Tanexamic acid, 1 gram for 10 minutes, followed by infusion for 8 hours. Crash two trial. Right? Then uh, disability and exposure, those things, no? All right, any, any questions? For, any questions? Hey, I'll, I will do a, a Few more MC questions are published in the group. And uh, uh, this, uh, what is this? I will do a SEQ session. Few people have requested me actually. Uh, friends, you have met Kalu Boiler, requested me to do few sessions. SEQ sessions. Uh, I'm going to do, and this is the plan, right? Uh, I will cover all the local uh, papers. We are put a Karabri Pera in Ragam Rajarata on these days. And uh, if you are happy, you can join for this as well. And uh, anyway, there will be a few MC positions as uh, some people request me to do. I will do it as a free session, right? And if you're happy, you can uh, join this too. And uh, if you have any doubt on this uh, today's paper, just uh, feel free to ask me. And uh, and actually, feedbacks are very important, right? Constructive criticism is very important to improve. I'm also new to this uh, thing. Zoom classes. So this has happened because I have met a few students 
at Kalibu during my first year training. Uh, yes, that's it. Uh, give me good and bad things, everything. Feel free to drop me a message and if you are happy, you can join. Right, that's it for the day. Uh, yes, so hope I have almost covered everything. If you have missed anything also, just let me. Another thing about that, uh, let's see. Let's see is still the commoners, no? Mortality has been reversed. You see and everything. Uh, mortality has been improved with regard to Bessie. And uh, this uh, still the commoners CS, even if it's a female thing, commoners CS, Bessie, right? Have you all checked it there? Commoners Casino and Sri Lanka? Right. All right. Then what else? Anything you all want to know? Yes, do uh, we have finished by time at least. No. Anything you all know? Right. Right. Then Shall we wind up? I don't understand here. Any bad comments? Any things to. Who is this Kiribaba? Anyway. Kiribaba is answering. Hello. Yeah. All right. Good night. When is the exam? When do you have. When do you. Have the exam. We will face the exam. Two more months, my dear. Okay, we done. Right, right, right. Okay. Then we don't have rush now. Okay. Anyway, right. We'll call it a day. Thank you very much. Good night. Huh?